Welcome to the Neurosurgeon's Journey, part of the Library of Brain and Spine Group's Medical Student Neurosurgery Training Center and a collaboration with the AANS's Young Neurosurgeons Committee. I'm your co-host, Michael Quartz. I'm currently the Senior Student Director of Education Resources for MSNTC, and shortly we'll be joined by your other co-host, Dr. Jeremiah Johnson. He is an Assistant Professor of Neurosurgery at the Baylor College of Medicine and is the current chair of the YNC. We're happy to have you with us as we look deeper into the rewarding life of a neurosurgeon and explore what it takes to get there. Welcome back to TNJ Podcast. Dr. Johnson, good afternoon. How are you? I'm doing well, Michael. Keep him warm. Keep him warm. You're down in Texas. Thoughts go out to you and everyone who's been affected by the recent uh, blizzards and storms down in Texas. I know that the crazy weather coupled with not being as prepared as uh, Northern States might be makes for a terrible situation. Um, I know a lot of people have been affected. And uh, also to that end, before we start about uh, start in with our topic and introduce our guests, I want to make a, a quick note. We reached a grim milestone here in the United States with 500,000 COVID deaths, obviously much more than that globally. Here at MSNTC and YNC, we just offer our sincerest thoughts and deepest condolences to everyone who has lost a family member, friend, coworker, uh, or all the above been economically impacted. Um, I know a lot of healthcare workers even are having a hard time finding jobs as well as, you know, Dr. Johnson, our guests and all the healthcare workers who have been fighting COVID directly or innovating new ways to treat their patients and educate future physicians. So just wanted to make a note of that uh, to start our uh, episode for today. Also to put on our guest radar, um, we have a couple programming uh, events coming up uh, with the new academic calendar on the MSNTC side. The West Coast Virtual Training Camp will be March 27th, and the East Coast version will be on May 1st. So be uh, following our social media accounts and the website, keep updated with that, as well as any changes that may occur. It seems to be as good, if not better, uh, than it was last year. Also, there are two events that are great companions to our discussion today. Uh, We had a leadership conference um, on the MSNTC side that was hosted in December, as well as the grit and resilience talk that the YNC did with their webinar series that I wanted to uh, illuminate that you guys should check out on the organization's respective YouTube channels. All right, enough of me talking. So let's get into our topic for today. We're going to be diving into the lessons that, you know, human beings who want to do something hard like neurosurgery or other competitive specialties or anything else, really, that they can learn from the, the military. Um, you know, we, we discuss how the military and neurosurgery may be similar and different, as well as grit, resilience, how to get back up when you're down 100 times and, you know, anything leadership. To help us do that, we have two guests, uh, Dr. Jonathan Martin and Dr. Ryan Rodwanski. I'll start with Dr. Martin. He's currently the Paul M. Caniff Chair of Pediatric Neurosurgery at Connecticut Children's in Hartford. His military background includes six years of prior enlisted time as an infantryman in the Army National Guard and 12 years of service in the U.S. Army. That included time as a general medical officer with the 3rd Infantry Division, military residency training in neurosurgery at Walter Reed Medical Center, and a four-year utilization tour as a neurosurgeon that included a six-month combat deployment to Iraq in 2007. Dr. Martin, thanks for being on. Hey, happy to do it, Mike. Thanks very much for inviting me. Absolutely. Um, Second guest is Ryan. Uh, He's a friend, colleague, mentor, and boss of mine who also happens to be a U.S. Marine who served with 1st Battalion, 11th Marines in Helmand Province, Afghanistan. During four years of active enlisted service, Ryan was meritoriously promoted three times, was awarded the Naval Achievement Medal, and earned a combat action ribbon in theater. Ryan was honorably discharged from the U.S. Marine Corps in 2012, after which he completed his college and medical school at Cornell. Ryan went on to found the Medical Student Neurosurgery Training Camps and Training Center, uh, which has blossomed into what it is today, and we're all excited to see what it will become in the future. Ryan, thanks for coming on, man. Hey, Mike, Dr. Johnson, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to uh, have finally found a good episode of the TNJ to uh, jump on myself. Yeah, we're, we were uh, really chomping at the bit to have you come on. So we're, I'm, I think this is a great topic for you to give your two cents in. So Dr. Johnson, we'd love to get your initial thoughts on grit and resilience and discuss how those two things come together, whether or not you think they can be learned traits or are they just a byproduct, a manifestation of, you know, you going through challenges in, in your life. And, you know, some people may come into those, come into contact with those more than others. And then how those ideas apply before your training through during your training. And then, and then afterwards. That's a good question. I think, Michael, I think that the, 
the bottom line of whether they're learned or innate is that there's probably a little bit of a both. People that are subselected to be interested in neurosurgery, something that takes you know years of dedication and training on top of undergrad and medical school. You want to do like kind of like one of the longer, more challenging residency programs. It may subselect for people that have some of these innate grit characteristics and resilience characteristics inborn. That said, I think you can always improve upon that. Just to maybe clarify to everyone who may not know the kind of general definitions of grit and resilience, maybe maybe I'll kind of go over them. And then we can kind of talk about whether, and more intelligently, or at least on the, all on the same page about about what the what you know whether you can improve upon your skills and these things or not. So um, they're kind of two interrelated terms. And grit, uh, as as defined, is is pretty much the perseverance and passion towards a long term goal. More or less, whether you can sustain a committed a commitment to an, a long term endeavor despite failure, setbacks, and adversity. That's more or less grit. Resilience, on the other hand, you know, has a very a variety of definitions, more or less, um, but generally refers to the ability of someone to maintain or regain mental health after experiencing an episode of adversity. So, to have grit and to be able to follow a long term goal uh, despite setbacks, you kind of need to have resilience and it, the ability to bounce back from negative emotional experiences. So, so I think resilience probably is needed to have successful long-term grit, so to speak, to, to achieve long-term difficult goals where you have to keep an eye on, on this goal for long periods of time and endure setbacks to reach it. So I, I think all of us have some degree of that of those characteristics that are interested in neurosurgery. I think is what gets you through undergrad as a high achiever and through medical school as a high achiever. There's certainly, uh, you know, most likely in most people's past, there's going to be setbacks in those stages as well. But I do think that you can get better and better with time, either formally or informally. I think some even residency programs now, as we've kind of outlined in that NREF Young Neurosurgeons webinar that you referenced earlier, is on the NREF YouTube page, easily Googleable to get a really good overview of all this. But I do think that we can improve upon that either formally, as they talk about in that in that session about how you can actually integrate some of these concepts into your training program formally. But also just just by modeling. So what I would say is that I'm a big believer that you kind of absorb the characteristics of the people you spend the most time with, uh, and there's various ways that people you know cut that up. You know, the two or three or four or five most people you spend the most time with. But I think that is true in a lot of ways that your support system and who you see, who you're around, and who model you model their their thoughts as well. So if you have other people around you who are very dedicated, high achieving, don't let setbacks get them down. I think that. Think that you get better. And if you add that to the group dynamic of in our particular residency program where they really value this type of thing, or just in your personal peer group, you know, someone that you know really well that you call when you're when you're having a hard time that helps encourage you to get back on track. I, I certainly think that you know your local environment and your peer group can help you become more resilient. You can also by yourself study these things and become more resilient over time. That's my thoughts. Dr. Martin, I would love for you to talk about your path to and through the military to and through neurosurgery and how those two parts of your lives came together, as well as the, the lessons that you learned that were similar and maybe things that you found different, you know, things that maybe in neurosurgery we don't get that we could get from the military, whether it's practice or just being a <laughs> good person or whatever you'd like to elaborate on. I'd love to hear that. And, and maybe talk about more about your just, you know, your personal path um, as context. Yeah, I mean, if, if you're looking for someone who you know has made his way through uh, uh, learning hard lessons and failing, you get the right guy. I mean, uh, you know, the, the reality is certainly one of the best ways to to learn is is to make stay, make mistakes and stay in the game. Uh, and I've I, I've certainly made my fair share of mistakes over time. And I think grit and resilience are certainly an important part of staying in the game. Ryan and I actually were having a brief conversation. Uh, I'll be interested to sort of tweak him on that in a little bit about there are a lot of folks in neurosurgery who they like to equate, you know, what is done in neurosurgery to special operations uh, um, in the military. And I think that's probably why folks who are listening to this today, why at least a component of them are listening to uh, uh, to this today. The military is very interesting. Uh, I definitely am going to be a champion in terms of for the military cause. I think it was one of the best decisions I ever made to get in, engaged and involved in the military. Uh, and there's no question it, it, it shaped my career in a number of ways that I wouldn't have anticipated. All fantastic, most unexpected. Can you expand on that a little bit? I mean, what I'd love to sit on that for a second. And, and what are sure. some of those things that let's, let's talk about the, the beauty 
of the military. Um, I think we think, you know, we grit, you're in the mud. Let's talk about the beauty of it and the things that you learned that made you who you are today. So um, when I'm a young guy, I'm, I'm 18 years old. I'm a freshman in college. Honestly, at the height of the PC movement back in the, in the late 1980s, I really just was not resonating with uh, a lot of uh, my classmates at Bowdoin College. I felt um, I, I did not feel culturally like I was well suited. And I ended up enlisted in, in the military, largely because I had a lot of friends. I used to race biathlon, so skiing, shooting. Uh, I was competitive there. And I had a number of people that I knew that were on the army team. And they said, hey, look, this is a great place to go hang out and, and do something. And, you know, at 18, I said, yeah, it sounds great. So my whole purpose of getting in the military to begin with was you know, to be culturally hanging out with people that that I saw that were similar. And I will, if you take a look at, you know, the the, the warrior culture, the warrior ethos in the military, the reality is, you know, one to 2% of folks in the United States have a relative who are in the military. It's a very small number. And when you start to actually take a look at families that go into the military, very commonly they do so because they had a, a relative who did so. So I think people gravitate towards the military for a number of different reasons. Uh, family experience can be one. I think that there's a culture and an ethos uh, that some people are seeking that they can find in the military. And for me, it was very much, you know, the sort of culture and ethos that I was looking for more than any direct familial experience with the military. It also didn't hurt to bank a little money. Um, you know, the reality is a lot of other people go into the military and, and many of the listeners here today may as well, because they're sitting there saying, you know what, being debt free at the end of medical school, maybe is not such a bad thing. So I think all of those things can can allow you to gravitate towards the military. Um, but ultimately, you know, what you find there, what you plan on, because my trajectory in terms of um, even, you know, I did my time enlisted. Um, I went on to medical school initially. I thought, yeah, I think I'd, I'd like a little more freedom, you know, to choose which direction I was going to go. Right. Uh, and after a year of, you know, eating at, you know, happy hours and uh, not being able to go to, you know, movies and hang out with my friends because I just didn't have a lot of money, the military scholarship looked pretty attractive to me. And so um, those were all reasons that I gravitated towards the military. I think the culture and the finances. So, and, and I think we can put some links. I know there are a couple articles, there's an article in, in the Red Journal that talks about military nurses. There's a few. Mike Rosier's um, article from a 2016 on that. Uh, he was okay. The- Author. No, and it does a very good job sort of talking about, you know, the trajectories that you can go on active duty and reserve. And, and what the benefits are financially, you know, some of the right. benefits, no advantages and disadvantages financially and things to be keeping in mind. Um, and, and we'll think, make sure those are on our website. Yeah. And I think, again, what you're going to see in there, you'll see a lot of those, those are quantifiable, easily quantifiable things. Some of the unquantifiable things over the course of my career, you know, some of the people that I met and interacted with are certainly, you know, names that you'll know in history. And then people that you'll never know um, who really touched and made my life. I mean, right. So, you know, the, there's there are people I'm holding up my bracelet, you know, a, a soldier that was very impactful to me. Um, mm-hmm. You know, the reality is that th- those experiences, those touches are remarkable, unique. And the experiences that, that I had, uh, particularly on active duty, were uh, were remarkable. I wouldn't trade them for anything. That's phenomenal. And I think we can touch on how <laughs> that part of your life influenced your work in pediatric neurosurgery now. I'd, I'd love to get that uh, down the road. But sure. uh, let's bring in Ryan. Um, Ryan, I'm going to ask you very directly, is the military and neurosurgery, are, are they the same thing? Well, are they the same thing? I think the very simple answer is no. How are they similar there's, or different? There's a lot of intangible attributes, you know, things that contribute to your emotional IQ as an individual. You grow up very quickly at a young age um, that help you sort of deal with a lot of the, presumably, obviously my career is barely getting launched. So I really can't speak from an extensive experience in neurosurgery. However, kind of as a kid, look, peering over the fence, looking into the neighbor's yard, you can kind of see where some of the intangible attributes of military service are going to help you in that career. Uh, But to just blatantly say they're similar, I think is a little bit too much of a blanket statement. I've never met, at least in my limited experience, a PGY-1 who is scared they're going to die on day one of their work as a resident. Um, you know, that's just a reality you face at 19 years old in, in the Middle East that uh, you're never going to face, as, you know, a, day, a single day in your life uh, practicing neurosurgery in the United States. So how did your time in the Marines forge your interest 
in neurosurgery, or at least how are those two things related? Well, I think the most kind of surface level answer is I worked as an electrical engineer uh, and diesel mechanic in the Marine Corps. And one of the things that I really enjoyed about that job was sort of the mental gymnastics of troubleshooting, you know, really trying to get to what is the root cause of a problem uh, with a piece of equipment. And every piece of equipment is mission critical. You don't get to just say, oh, this thing's broken and, uh, you know, we'll fix it six months later. You know, every, when you're deployed, every broken piece of equipment needs to be fixed, uh, you know, sooner rather than later. And you need to figure out what's wrong with it. And so that sort of intellectual curiosity really car- carried me through my career Uh, in the military. And then when I got out, you know, I wanted to find a job where I was intellectually curious about every case and had something to fix when it was all said and done. So it really didn't take me too long to draw parallels to a career in academic surgery. And then pretty quickly as I got into college and started looking for uh, mentors in medicine and things of, along those lines, I got connected with neurosurgeons and really never looked back. I mean, I explored a little bit during medical school, but by the time I even I made it to medical school, I had a relatively clear idea of what I thought I wanted to do. And the time I spent surveying surgical subspecialties in medical school is really just to confirm uh, an interest that I thought I already had. And that's absolutely the direction I've decided to go. That's great. That's great. So, Dr. Johnson, we talked a little bit about, you know, where people will be facing challenges in their career and in and, and their training. And obviously, it starts even back in undergrad and, and on the civilian side and for everyone who will be facing challenges. Um, where in training and how in training do you feel like, you know... <laughs> really the rubber meets the road? I mean, is it day after day, every day, or are there certain times throughout your training that you find yourself in three scenarios that you'll remember for the rest of your life that you learned the most about yourself? Or is it more just about, you know, seven years and then fellowship, and then you just keep doing it day after day? What, how would you say? I mean, in my, it's to me, actually, the, the journey to neurosurgery has its ups and downs and, and difficulties, but, uh, I mean, I think the journey of medicine actually has a lot of the similar things. So if you've already made it through MCATs and through medical school, you felt a lot of the same things you're going to feel in residency. It's just at a different, sort of a slightly different context. Uh, I remember the stress of taking MCATs, you know, this one exam that's going to decide if you get into medical school or not. That's a big inflection point in your life. And I, I felt as much stress around that time as I, I really have since then. Step one is another similar another similar time. And once you're in medical school, take another exam. Once you're into residency, it is, it is, I found it, at least in my program and for pretty much every program I've been affiliated with to be kind of a frenetic first few years where you have to learn a lot very quickly and your performance really does affect patient care and patient outcomes. Um, and you feel to some degree unprepared for that. And there's of course, different management styles of your senior residents and you know, your faculty about how they coach you through those things. And that can be more or less stressful depending on, on your, the sort of leadership style that's around you. But that said, it's always stressful. I remember uh, my, my wife recorded me talking my spe- sleep a few times during, you know, internship, talking about INR levels of patients and someone I had forgot discharged and forgotten to get an MRI for discharge and all kinds of like, and she, she used to record these things on early versions of smartphones when we were, I was in my first year of training. So it, it, I, I don't think I've ever done that before or since. Um, so it does have like kind of a psychological effect on you, particularly the junior years. And when you have uh, you know, I very clearly remember incidents where patients declined and or died when I was alone, you know, in-house on call. You just have to take a break, go I used to go outside and sit by the fountain <laughs> and and think like, what did I do? Did I do anything wrong? If so, how can I get better? And and there's a bit of a guilt and a sadness to, to that kind of thing happening, you know, kind of on your watch. Uh, and so you do have to have some of these qualities of, of being resilient, you know, having a bad experience, being able to kind of emotionally get through it and then having the grit to keep going and not wanting to quit. So, so I think the, the entire experience of going through the medical training process from start to finish has a lot of these components to it. So I don't think I would necessarily tell people that there's something completely different about being in neurosurgery training than, than the tr- some of the other aspects of the training process, in my view. It's a different set of challenges but they're doable. You just have to, you just have to stick you know, to working hard, focusing on learning and improving, learning from mistakes, and you know, having a good support system 
when you're feeling really down about something that may, may have happened. Um, and I also think that it is to some degree also a matter of picking a residency training program that fits with your personality and your goals, because I think everybody kind of has some degree different ways they deal with things. And it's nice to have a group of people that you get along with uh, to, to, to help you through those times. So Dr. Mai, I'd love for you to just respond to that. How do you, how do you get back up when you're, this is for <laughs> people who are, you know, in their third, second year residency, or they've got the pager all day, every day, and they're tired and, you know, maybe made a couple of mistakes on the floor or something. How do you, how do you come back from that? What, what are, what do you think that you do to mentor people who are in their early stages of their training to um, come back from being a detriment to a mission critical system, which is obviously the nervous system that we are operating on. I'm not operating on one day we'll be operating on. I'd love you to just respond to that, Dr. Martin. I mean, so uh, in tying in a couple of different conversations that have been had here, um, you know, do I think that grit and resilience can be uh, taught? Absolutely. I think that, you know, the reality is anyone who's ever been on a team recognizes that, you know, when you have a captain of that team who's leading from the front, who's, you know, setting the example, you're willing to burn a lot of capital in yourself to carry a load behind that individual. I think that, you know, people who don't feel that way probably aren't going to be successful in neurosurgery period. And I think most people have at least some components of that. Uh, I think that from a leadership perspective, the most challenging thing as a leader is not to get A quality people to deliver A or A plus work. The real challenge as a leader is to have folks that are C plus B minus in terms of their abilities that you can bring up to A level over time. And I think that those are all things that are absolutely true and why leadership is so important. And leaders come in all sorts of different flavors. I've worked with a number of, of leaders that were successful who were absolute curmudgeons. And I mean, they pounded you in the ground like a stake. And under the right circumstances, that can actually be very effective. Right. Um, I think it's less effective in 2021 than it used to be. Um, I had other people who literally, I would have unquestionably taken a bullet for them. No question at all. You know, uh, shoot me, not that individual, because I need them around because I care more about this mission. Why, why, what, what qualities are those kind of people? I mean, again, I think that that comes down to, I can tell you what that person is for me in, in general terms, but again, these are people who, you know, number one, are very competent at what they do. Number two, they communicate uh, effectively and usually essentially they, they give you what you need to be able to get things done. They're very ethical in terms of the way they uh, conduct their day and they're fair. I don't think, you know, these are things you learned everything you need to know about this in kindergarten. That That's just the reality that the kind of person that you wanted to make a sandcastle next to, it doesn't <laughs> end up being a whole lot different that's when great. you're 30 than it does when you're five. But I think that the, Dr. Johnson's point, your pressures change, right? When you're taking your MCATs and you're, you're terrified about taking that. I remember those stresses too. And much like being, I'm a parent, so I have two daughters, right? I mean, I certainly didn't understand 20 years ago what it meant to have a mortgage and run a department and manage my clinical practice. And all of these things end up being layers that get built on that you learn to be more effective in terms of performing your job every single year. How do I multitask better? How do I get, importantly, how do I delegate responsibilities to people who are capable of achieving those and motivate them to, to do those things? Those are all skills that you will acquire over time if you're going to be effective in this. And they'll allow you to function. But to your point, and I think a lot of the listeners here today, if you think you get to a point where you have all of the answers, let, let, me, let me burst that bubble for you right now. I continue to learn every single day in this job. And that's why to answer your question, I get out of bed at two, you know, two in the morning to come in and revise the shunt or, you know, deal with an intracranial hemorrhage or deal with those things. Be because to me, I'm following in the footsteps of people who model for me what it meant being a neurosurgeon meant to me personally. I'm also a product of people who are not good mentees. You know, they can stand as sort of uh, uh, the dark energy to that's that's not the direction I want to go. But I, you learn from all of those people. Going back to what Ryan said earlier on, while I do think that there are similarities between you know, the military and neurosurgery, the big divide between those two is um, it feels pretty lousy to go out and tell uh, a family their loved one has passed when you've done everything you can do. That's, it's a lousy feeling, but it's a whole lot different than uh, having around, you know, come by your head or go through your leg. And I've had both of those things happen. And I'll tell you, they feel a lot different. Wow. That was, that was phenomenal. <laughs> that was very profound. Thank you. 
Ryan and uh, Dr. Martin eloquently talked about leadership, grit, resilience, a lot of different topics, both for him personally. And I think lessons that all of us can take forward. Um, I certainly know I will. But for you personally, I would love to hear who is the leader that you would take a bullet for? What are the qualities of that person that you know really stand out and that will inform who you will be through your training and, and ultimately as an attending and just a, just a person? It's a good question. It's a hard question to answer. Um, you know, specifically in neurosurgery, I consider, I guess, having for someone in my position, you know, the, the limited exposure I've had, I, I feel that I've had the opportunity to meet and work with a relatively diverse number of people over the last, you know, five, six, seven years, however long I've been kind of on this path. The one person that I kind of look at and go, you know, if I, if given the opportunity, if you'll call it that, to take a bullet for them, I would, would probably be uh, Dr. Susan Panulo at Cornell. I think she's the most genuine person I've ever met and would never, never do anything to kind of self-promote herself, but everything she does is selfless. And I've absolutely felt that, you know, in her mentorship over the last five years or so. I know when I was in the ICU at the VA hospital during medical school, she was calling past attendings uh, who you worked at Cornell 10, 15 years ago, and we're now faculty downtown at the VA hospital. She was calling them, telling them that, uh, you know, they better take good care of me and stuff like that. And, um, you know, she's the type of person that'll just go to bat for you, no matter what, gives it to you straight when you need to hear it straight and, you know, picks you up and dusts you off when you really need, you know, kind of be picked up after a failure. And for that reason, you know, for a lot of those reasons and how she does it so selflessly, I would absolutely you know, look to her as somebody that I would absolutely make that sacrifice for. If that, hopefully that answers your question. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, in my, in my few interactions with her, I've definitely picked that up. And so what are the qualities that you've gleaned from her? And obviously there's many um, people that we come into contact with that you feel like you really want to take with you, whether that's in the last five, six years or before that, when you were in the Marines, I mean, what, are, who do you want to be when you are a chief resident? Well, the simple answer to that question is who do I want to be is me. I mean, I don't, I think you take your lessons from everyone. I mean, I remember uh, getting a heads up from my staff sergeant about a week beforehand, letting me know, hey, you, I submitted your package for meritorious corporal promotion. The first sergeant and the CEO approved your package. So you're going to get promoted next week. I, generally it's, you're not really supposed to know these things ahead of time, but you wanted to give me a heads up. And so I knew about a week ahead of time. And one of the things I kind of used that week for, uh, being as this happened all in the middle of uh, Mojave Viper, which is a training exercise in 29 Palms. So I'm literally out in the middle of, uh, the Southern California desert with nothing to do except work on equipment, go on training, uh, operations, uh, whenever they came up and, spend the rest of the hours of my day kind of reflecting on, you know, what, who am I going to be as a non-commissioned officer? And one of the things I did was I started making a list of all the people that I really respected as a non-commissioned officer, people that I thought really were very poor non-commissioned officers and really spent a lot of time thinking about what made the good ones good, what made the bad ones bad, and keeping this list of attributes that I wanted to embody as, a, as an NCO and attributes that I absolutely wanted to stay away from. And I found myself over the years, very frequently looking at more specifically the, the things that I really thought made poor NCOs, because sometimes there would be times where I catch myself and, you know, I'd really have to think like, okay, if I continue to treat this person, this Marine entrusted to my charge this way, I am doing the exact thing that I said I hated about you know, such and such NCO. And I changed my behavior because of it. And I think the, that good leaders have the ability to do that. They never get it right every single time, but they never lean on the assumption that they're doing things right. They always sort of reflect internally as to, you know, these lists that they've made previously about good qualities of leadership and poor qualities of leadership and challenge themselves to say is the way I'm handling this situation, this challenging situation, you know, maybe as an attending or a resident and you're struggling with, you know, working with one of your junior residents and you're, you know, do you ask yourself, um, am I handling this in a situation in such a way that embodies the 
characteristics of quality leadership that I truly know, or am I sort of letting myself slip down that path of uh, poor leadership and really need to reevaluate? And the people who can make those adjustments on the fly, who take the time to stop, reflect, and make adjustments to how they react and respond, I think are absolutely great leaders. It doesn't mean they never make mistakes, but when they do make mistakes, they they find a way to sort of right the path and do, you know, conduct themselves in the way that they know is the best way possible. And I've found myself even in situations of leading MSNTC where, you know, I've come down a little hard on a volunteer and then I kind of go back and I review the facts and I'm like, man, I really misjudged this situation. And yeah, I can't take back what I said, but what I can do is I can sit that person down and I can say, I'm sorry. Look, I misjudged the situation. Um, this is what I thought. This is why I responded the way I did. That doesn't justify my response, but I see where you're coming from now and we're going to do this right together going forward. And uh, I've never been met with uh, a negative response from that. Most people are generally pretty appreciative uh, when you're able to sort of be self-reflective in that way as a leader. Well, yes, I, I accept your apology, Ryan. Um, I wasn't apologizing to you. You're still in the doghouse. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dr. Martin, I'd like to transition a little bit to your practice today and contrasting that with what you did in Iraq. But, you know, especially in pediatrics, they seem, at least to my naive eye, very different to what you were potentially doing in, in both scenarios. I'd love for you to just talk to that end a little bit. Yeah, so you'd think so, and you'd be wrong. Um, you know, one of the interesting things about an insurgent war, although I can't say, I mean, again, a, a theater war like World War II, you, know, you can certainly go through it and you can uh, you can read the history it's written. But about 30 to 40% of the casualties that I saw were host nation casualties. And quite a few of those were children. So, uh, you know, the reality is kids get carried. You said host nation, nation sorry for interrupting. Right. Yeah, okay. no, I, I took care of a ton of Iraqi children. And, you know, they, uh, these were not kids, you know, there, there certainly were teenage insurgents that were getting out there in harm's way. But a lot of these kids, you know, were very, uh, very concrete memories of, you know, kids that were, they were in their parents' car and they were driving and it was hit by an IED or it was hit by, you know, fire from an engagement between U.S. forces and, and local insurgents. You know, children, they, they, they get in the way, they get curious, they pick up um, unexploded ordnance. And the reality is that uh, that's something that I can tell you as, a, as a, a physician going downrange, a lot of people aren't prepared for. That is a very different circumstance. Ryan, I can share with you, you know, we had at our, our base hospital, right? We had, you know, front gate was very heavily secured. Um, we definitely had circumstances where a family came running up with an, a wounded child, you know, shot in the head or, you know, shot in the chest. Um, and you would see active duty MPs go from locked in, you know, um, protocol to dropping their weapon and running in with a kid. It's very disarming to see kids get gutted to get their heads blown off for anyone. Uh, and so the the reality is that you know as a as a military provider in a war zone, you will be taking care of. I don't care if you're an adult or a surgeon. You'll be taking care of kids more than likely, depending on the rules of engagement or the medical rules of engagement. You know that that's that certainly is the reality of my experience. So. Do you mind contrasting that with what you're doing now and maybe some of the lessons that you took from there to, to now? Yeah, I mean, I, I can certainly say that, you know, ultimately what I learned, uh, what I learned about trauma was, uh, I mean, phenomenal. And uh, there's no question. It, it certainly being being ankle deep in blood is, is not something that is either foreign or troubling to me anymore. Mm -hmm. I remember being a medical student. And seeing these videos from Vietnam trauma sort of bays and, you know, see them, you know, hack it off limbs and things I'm like, geez, I, I can't imagine that. Well, I, I can certainly imagine it now. Right. You know, Hippocrates said, if you want to learn how to operate and go to war. And uh, you know, that that's still very, very much true. I, so I think it, it certainly, you know, from a from a neurosurgical perspective, comfort with trauma. And I will also say from a craniofacial surgery perspective, if you want to learn how to take a head apart for craniostenostosis, um, one of the one of the best uh, uh, sort of places to cut your teeth is, you know, taking uh, taking complex OMFS fractures uh, and uh, transcranial injuries to the operating room. I learned a ton about skull based surgery through trauma. Wow. But, you know, relative to what I do today, I mean, you know, that was obviously a mixed adult and pediatric practice in theater um, and everything that I take care of uh, now today is, is children. But it, does it has it informed my practice in terms of trauma? Absolutely. My understanding is that you 
like you said, if you're, if you did adult nurse surgery, you're going to be treating kids and probably vice versa. Is that kind of the case in terms of being more of a jack of all trades type thing when you're yeah. um, in the army or Navy or whatever? Yeah, so that's a great question. I mean, more general question about military neurosurgery. I mean, the right. job of a military neurosurgery training program is to train the military neurosurgeon. The military neurosurgeon is, you know, we certainly have uh, people who are um, subspecialized in any discipline, you know, uh, uh, you want to think about out there. And Jeremiah probably knows Rocco Armanda, you know, in terms of uh, neurovascular surgery, you know, there, there are slouches uh, that are former neurosur- neurosurgeons in the military, like, I don't know, Kevin Foley. I mean, he never came up with any interesting inventions to ever, uh, whatever, however, hundred, however, hundred million dollars he's worth. I mean, the reality is you, you have some pretty exceptional people who come through, but the reality is what you need to be able to do on a daily basis is you have to be a general neurosurgeon. You do need to be able to do right? And you need to be able to do uh, intracranial oncology. You need to be able to do trauma. You need to be able to do peripheral nerve. You need to be able to do degenerative spine. You need to be comfortable doing uh, a wide variety of things, pediatrics. I, I think uh, having trained in the military system, the uh, the residency does a good job of doing that, about making you think about, you know, how do you do things downrange? Because uh, mm-hmm. you don't have all the same instruments and or support, obviously, but you can get creative and solve problems. And I, I think that you know, certainly my uh, uh, my cohort of residents. I'm very proud of the the people that we trained, um, mm-hmm. and many of those people have gone on. They've done fellowships and they've subspecialized and they've done things beyond. And, and I think we have a group of people who are very capable of doing that. I think the, the the military, in terms of neurosurgery, there are a lot worse places you can train than that, my friend. Wow, that's great. That's great, Doctor Johnson. Do you have any particular questions for? Dr. Martin and, and Ryan, I didn't know if you had anything particular, yeah, especially I do, with your, actually. with your, uh, where you're at and your training. Yeah, your, I have a, actually training. a couple of questions, but the first one I think is one maybe will eventually transpose to the earlier part of the show. We'll see from someone who really knows nothing about this other than observing several people I know well go through the process of training uh, in neurosurgery and uh, spending time in the military. Is it possible to kind of give an overview of the points of entry into the military. I mean, I know people can certainly go through as early as ROTC and into the military, you know, through undergraduate training. Uh, I know that you can kind of become, like you alluded to earlier, Dr. Martin, uh, have um, points of entry in medical school where they'll help pay for some of your, your, your training. How do you go about showing an interest in going to the military and what points in various levels of training is that possible? Yeah, no, I think it's a great question and a practical question for the listeners. Um, I think, you know, from the standpoint of most entry in terms of neurosurgery is going to happen in medical school. The ROTC route it gets a little circuitous, but it, there are additional obligations and it gets a little messy in terms of getting there. So we're going to forego that and just think about, you know, routes into military neurosurgery beyond undergrad. One would be to go through Uniform Services Medical School. So that's that's an application process, just like medical school is. It does incur some um, obligation, but people can certainly come through there and apply in neurosurgery um, uh, to go on and, and uh, pursue neurosurgery in that fashion. Another way is through the Health, Pre- Health Profession Scholarship Program. That's available as a three or four year program. There are obligations that are incurred with that. And in general, what you end up receiving is payment for your medical school plus a stipend and uh, ultimately, you incur obligation beyond beyond your training. How that's c- computed, I don't want to get too far into the weeds there because I'm probably not the perfect person to answer that question. And I think that is a bit of a moving target. Another route for people to go is they can join the reserves, right? So uh, joining the reserves, you can also do that, I believe, during residency. I don't think you can do that during medical school. What that ends up incurring is a little different. It's not an active duty obligation. It's an obligation where you you are paid a stipend during your residency. And then after your residency, um, you have to do some time. It's usually um, you know a weekend, a month, and two weeks during the summer. And there are, are other opportunities or risks, depending on how you look at it, of serving usually in a backfill capacity. Although deployments did happen in some for some individuals in the reserves during these past conflicts. In terms of one question, I would have if I if I were a student is well okay, I want to go into neurosurgery, how likely is it that they're going to let me do that and train? And what I can tell you is the uh, the Army, the Air Force, and the Navy every year have two billets for neurosurgery. So if you're a medical student and you're applying, uh, depending on what service you're in, that's the number of opportunities uh, that are available for each service to train. 
there is some cross leveling that can go on. So if there are, you know, four applicants in the Navy and none in the Air Force, right, you can you can see them cross level. And that's happening more and more as military medicine is gravitating more towards, you know, sort of we call it more of a purple suit program where, uh, you know, the reality is that in the 1980s and 1990s, the, the uh, your service mattered very much. You didn't see Navy neurosurgeons practicing at Army facilities. But I, I think those lines are blurring more and more. And, you know, sort of this more uh, DHA model where it's it's blind to service. It doesn't matter which service you're in. Uh, you're just you're ultimately caring for family members and active duty service members at these facilities. And in general, I think right now what you're looking at is right around 20 active duty uh, neurosurgeons in the Army and Navy, and probably about half that in the Air Force um, uh, at a given time. Does that, I know there was a lot of information in there. Did that help? Very much so. Yeah, thank you for that. I, I do have one other question related to this, though, which is there seems to be a group of people that are in the military medical school that match both in the military neurosurgery training program, which I believe is up in Washington, D.C. or Virginia, as well as a group of people who are under the military umbrella who match into civilian programs that are paid for by the military. Mm -hmm. Do do you have any sense of what that process is like and who who those kind of different pathways serve? Yeah, I think that's been a moving target as well. So the Walter Reed, uh, so the National Capital Consortium Residency Program is now at the uh, the Walter Reed facility in Bethesda, Maryland. Um, they take a resident a year. There are also three VA sponsored programs. I believe there are two in Texas and one in Florida. So that's a total of four slots where you're essentially being paid like you're on active duty to train. There are There's also the ability of a service to defer your training. So what they do is they say, okay, we need neurosurgeons. There aren't places for us to train you. We'll give you a deferment to go out and train uh, at a civilian program. You have to get accepted into it, obviously. Uh, again, you know, if you sit there and do the numbers, that means in a given year, there may be, there are usually a couple of deferments that are handed out um, and which service they are they go to is variable. I, I think the thing to keep in mind is ultimately you know, the needs of the military are the needs of the military. And you can, you know, you can always try to negotiate. Negotiating with big army, big Navy, or big Air Force is a challenge when (laughs) when you're an O3 or a first lieutenant, you're uh, going to have a hard time. Now, what I would say is on the flip side of that, you know, what if disaster happens and you end up being one of, you know, one of these folks who ultimately you know, doesn't match or isn't given permit. Is is that the end of your career? Because I certainly remember being a medical student and thinking, you know, that could happen. Oh my God. I have a number of friends that are neurosurgeons that, you know, I still stay in touch with who ultimately, you know, they, they either didn't match or didn't want to train, you know, uh, where it was offered. They didn't want to train at Walter. They thought a better match would be somewhere else. And so what they did was they did a general medical officer tour for three years and then went on to be very successful in training. In fact, they probably were more competitive when they went back, largely because they had some real world experience, particularly in leadership. You know, Ryan was talking earlier on about um, about a lot of concepts in leadership that an awful lot of medical students and undergrads have zero experience with, right? If your, your view of your day is, I'm gonna get up, I'm gonna work out, you know, I'm gonna study for six or seven hours, Um, Then I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, you know, go have fun with my friends. There's not a lot of time in there where people are, are, you know, learning how to be leaders. And the reality is an awful lot of people, they learn to do that sort of on the job, oftentimes with not great guidance. And the reality is I can tell you, you know, certainly as a division chief now, the, the things that consume most of my time are dealing with human resources struggles, right? So when I have, when I have an employee in my division that is, that's a challenge, uh, it consumes an awful lot of my time. It makes me feel badly for when I'm sure I did that uh, to people in the past. Uh, the reality is that an awful lot of what you can learn in the military in any uh, as a general medical officer or, you know, as a, as a trainee those leadership lessons are really, really valuable to running an effective team. No, thank you. That's, that's, 
Uh, tremendous advice. Ryan, it sounds like you had a slightly different path. You were in the military as an enlisted enlisted in the military as a in the undergrad level, or how, how did your experience vary from Dr. Martin's? Yeah, that's exactly correct. So after high school, I joined the Marine Corps. I uh, did that largely because at the time of graduate, you know, staring down the barrel of high school graduation and college, I just decided plain and simple, I didn't want to go to college. My older brother joined the Marine Corps. Uh, that, he was the type of person who always wanted to join the military since the day he was a little kid. That was pretty much the only thing he ever wanted to do. I never once considered it until it was time to go to college. And I thought, my goodness, I do not want to do this. And so I followed him. I joined the Marine Corps and I absolutely loved it. And, um, you know, I had a great uh, career kind of learning a tangible skill, learning leadership, having responsibility, you know, being 19 years old, walking around in the Middle East with you know, a million dollars of equipment in my charge and, you know, high explosives strapped to my leg. I mean, it's a valuable uh, experience. And by the time I got out, I decided, you know, that was when I wanted to be a doctor. And so I went and got accepted to undergrad and started my studies knowing like, I want to be a doctor. I want to be a surgeon. I'm going to hit my studies hard and just get after it. And that, uh, you know, allowed me to get into a decent medical school and you know, kind of follow things through from there. But, um, you know, in terms of sort of the benefits and the difference in the route to the military and college, the, the thing I tell people whenever they ask me is at the end of the day, it all boils down to four years of service is going to equate to about four years of paid schooling, however you want to go to school. For me, I decided to kind of take out some loans and use financial aid to cover my undergrad so that I could get my four years of medical school paid for by, um, by the military. And that was because I knew I wanted to go to medical school before, uh, you know, roughly around the time I got out of the military, you know, if had I not known that and used my four years to pay for my undergrad, and then later on in my undergrad decided I wanted to go to med school, I would have been in the same situation as every other med student trying to figure out how to pay for med school. And so that's sort of how I approached it and sort of the various options, but it really all boils down to a very simple four years of service. will get you about four years of school. Gotcha. And at this point, are you currently on like the civilian training route or are you going to um, be going through some sort of military type match? No. So I'm a full civilian training route, just like every other medical student. And actually surprisingly, I, you know, I've corresponded with uh, naval recruiters on and off to kind of find out if, you know, going back to the military would even really be an option for me. And because of the way the, the, uh, the H HSPS, the, the scholarship program works basically because the military uh, isn't paying did or did not pay for my medical school. My GI bill paid for my medical school. I'm not eligible to uh, enter into the military match. So that basically mm -hmm. said the only route I have back into the military or a military neurosurgery would be to go through the civilian match program, get trained at a civilian institution. And then once I'm fully board certified, I can voluntarily get go through the commissioning process to join if I so choose. But, um, you know, to actually be on a track that would uh, give me obligated service time is actually not even possible having done things the way that I've done it. I see. Interesting. Interesting. No, thank you for the clarification. That's, that's great. I wanted to toss my hat in the ring about leadership leaders that I would take a bullet for, so to speak within neurosurgery specifically, if that if that's all right. So, I mean, I think listening to the, these two talk about, people that they really admire that, and the leadership qualities they, 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 they admire and, and will wish to emulate. I would say, I would say a couple of things uh, came to mind. One is that the tremendous mentors I had, where I think a lot of my colleagues who I trained with would take a bullet for had a few qualities in common. They had varying degrees of leadership styles as was previously described, uh, you know, extremely strict, aggressive, you know, even somewhat volatile at times, or they could be understated and quiet and just give you what you need to know. But I think all of them had a couple of qualities that, that everyone really liked. And, and that quality is A, that they were very accomplished and competent, you know, one of the leaders in their field, you know, whatever subspecialty field may have been. Two is that they took the time to teach. And, and, and three is that you got the sense that they cared about you and your trajectory equal or more so to themselves, you know, they, they are essentially giving to you a sort of a part of their knowledge and, um, and, and advice. And they truly care about where you ended up and your trajectory and your outcome. And they didn't have to, it's very easy to, to just do your job and, 
have the residents do their job. But I think the people that engage you in training and advice and career advice and promote you in ways that they didn't have to, that are above and beyond, in addition to being competent and good human beings, those are the people that really endear sort of feeling that you that you would take a bullet for them. You know, they're, they're just above and beyond everything that they, that what they need to be doing in your benefit. You know, they take time away from their family, from whatever the case may be, get up early to teach you. And they really care about, about your outcome. And I think those people, you know, turn out to be the people that are mentors, A, but also be the mentors that people really feel uh, go above and beyond are the ones that are the ones that pour themselves into you way more than they have to. And every, and universally people love them. Yeah. Can I pile on one more thing on that? Cause I think um, uh, Jeremiah like nail on the head that the question that comes up oftentimes, I think for people is, well, how do you, I mean, how do you get from where I am now to there? How do I get to be that kind of men, mentor uh, when I'm a mentee? And I think, you know, it, in boiling it down to a simple phrase, it would be, you're looking for people who are accountable to the team. Because at the end of the day, if you've got somebody on your team who all they care about is what they got on you know, their neuroscience final, they're in a study group and they're more concerned about that than they are how you know, the, the weakest member of the team did. The, the person who's not looking out for the weakest member of the team at any point uh, during their training is probably not gonna be the person that Dr. Johnson is talking about. You're looking for people who, you know, being accountable to the team uh, is just so critical. I think people who live that, people who model that tend to be you know, people that you're going to want to be around. You want them in your sandbox for sure. And they definitely have to be honest and, and reliable and have great character. You, know, you don't have to worry about them pulling something over on you or taking advantage of you somehow. I mean, you have to absolutely trust them implicitly. Yeah, you know, something you said that I really I've mentioned to a handful of people is you use the words truly care a handful of times. And I think that is really the essence of it all. I've, you know, had this conversation with several people in the, you know, over my, you know, very small career in medicine to date is that doctors have to care. And I think everybody at some point learns either what it means to truly care or how to pretend to truly care. And the people who actually truly care and don't learn to just get by in their career as a physician by pretending to truly care, the people who really deeply truly care about other people, the people they work with, the patients they take care of, actually really deeply care about these people are the people who don't even have to try to be good mentors. They just are. They're good leaders. They're good mentors. They're wonderful colleagues to work with. And it's apparent to everyone around them. Yeah, particularly if you throw on top of that deep competence, right? You know, they're just excellent and they truly care and they care about promoting you and pouring their knowledge to you. I think that all that kind of like mixed together is, is you know, a necessary mixture. But uh, if you have all those characteristics, you're going to be, you're going to go far in the, in the mentorship department. I think that's a great place to end. Well, our guests have been Dr. Jonathan Martin and Ryan Rodwanski. Dr. Martin, thank you for being on. Thanks very much. Ryan, thanks so much, man. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. Hey, if you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, follow, and leave a comment in Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your audio content. Make sure to follow MSNTC and the YNC on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And check out our webpage at neurosurgerytraining.org slash TNJ, where you can find other episodes and links and resources related to today's conversation. Be sure to check out the YNC's webinar series and visit their webpage on AANS.org. If you have comments or ideas for episodes, or would like to join us to talk about anything neurosurgery related, our email address is tnjpodcast at neurosurgerytraining.org. We'd love to hear from you. Finally, I'd like to thank Matt Rosenthal, one of our fantastic MSNTC volunteers for helping with the editing and processing, and also thank all the fabulous people involved in this project. Have a great day, and we look forward to next time. Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.